Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's all stand in the house tonight. We're going to go into a time of prayer and into a time of worship. But before we get into that, I just want to remind you that this time of year is one of my favorite times of year because it's a time of, of growth. It's a time of being of things being reborn. It's, time, it's a time of new things to come. When the springtime rolls around, you have trees that bud back out. You have plants that bud back out. And there, there is growth that takes place. Sometimes with us, we grow. Sometimes we get a little stagnant. Sometimes we feel like that things may take a step back a little bit sometimes. The Lord may be working on us, but sometimes our flesh gets in the way. But it's always a season of growth for us. Sometimes we're riding high. Sometimes we're down in the valley. But I want to read you a scripture tonight in Philippians chapter 1. It says, being confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So I just want to remind somebody tonight, you may be down in the valley a little bit. You may be feeling down on yourself, feeling like you haven't grown a whole lot recently. But trust the process. You will make it through it because he has begun that good work in you. He has started changing you. He working on you and he is going to complete it until the day that the Lord returns. You can trust in that fact. The seasons may change in this life but our Lord is never changing. He is always the same. and We need to trust him. We need to keep believing on him because he is going to do a mighty work in each and every one of us. I just want us to go into a time of prayer tonight. If you have a need in your life, if you have something going on that you need the Lord to handle, I just want to ask that you would step out in faith tonight, that you would make your way to the front. There's nothing nothing going to get you up here. There's nothing that's going to attack you when you come to the front. But the Lord sees your faith whenever you say, all right, when I'm going to listen to the preacher man and he says step out in faith and you obey what he says, that's lining up with the will of God. That's lining up with his plan of authority. So I want to ask you, if you have a need, step out in faith tonight in this place and just see what God is going to do in your life. Lord, we just want to come to you right now. We just want to ask that you would just see the faith that is risen up in this house tonight, Lord. This, your word says that first and foremost, this will be the house of prayer. That's what we are doing tonight in this place, God. We are seeking after you, seeking after your will, seeking after your healing, seeking after your wisdom, Lord, seeking after the things that you have for us, God. Lord, we come to you tonight. Because, Lord, we know you're the fixer of our issues. Lord, we know that you are the great physician.
way or if you're here in person all the pans are fair game tonight but I just want to ask you if you would declare faith over this offering tonight if you would pray this prayer with me upon the authority of your word I have given and it shall be given unto me pressed down shaken together and running over I am a tither and I give my offerings I bring them today into your storehouse therefore the enemy is rebuked the curse is broken I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there's not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance 
walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in, and I am blessed going out, and all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. Come and give, church.
got a good crowd in here tonight. That's something to praise God about. If you all would help me pray over this group of young people tonight, if you would just stretch a hand towards the front. God, we just want to come to you right now, Lord. God, we, we have all these children, these young people up here tonight that are here tonight. Lord, there could be so many other places that they could be tonight, but they are in the house of the Lord. They're here to learn. They're here to grow. They're here to just to be able to feel your presence, Lord, to be able to allow you to work on them, Lord. God, I pray over each classroom tonight, Lord. I pray for the anointing on all the teachers. God, I pray that there's going to be something happen in these classes tonight, Lord. God, I pray that there's going to be a love that they've never felt before. I pray that there's going to be wisdom imparted into them. There's going to be knowledge imparted into them. Lord, I just pray that we can keep building that foundation. We can build that foundation of truth that they so much need in this world today. Lord, we thank you for everyone. I pray for a hedge of protection around each and every one of these kids up here, these young people. I just want to thank you for everything that you do. Thank you for all your blessings. In Jesus' name. Braxton, go ahead. As they're on their way back, let's just welcome our pastor to the pulpit. He's going to bring us a word from heaven tonight. We just thank the Lord for our pastor. Praise the Lord, everybody. Good to see you. Wednesday night church. I like Sundays. I love Sundays. But I special love Wednesdays. There's something, there's just something about diving into the Word. Brand new series tonight, something I feel like the Lord has put on me very heavily. Uh, I even met with Brother Parkey a couple of weeks ago, and, and uh, I, I, uh, I've talked to some other pastors, and what we're going to teach, begin teaching tonight, I don't know how many weeks that it'll go, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't anticipate it going 12 or 14 weeks like the last series did. But uh, I will say before I get started while the fellas are handing the papers out, uh, the, the last series about growth, you can't just let it be over because the series ended. Right, right, right. These growth opportunities have got to happen, and you have got to pursue them. You have to. Yeah, you have to. And uh, it's, it's essential. And, and uh, uh, tonight we're going to teach other essentials. And uh, we're, we're going to find out that the Lord really is. I heard somebody say one time that they didn't believe the Lord was that narrow-minded. And I tell you right now, fast, quick, and in a hurry, he is very narrow-minded. Yeah. He don't play. If you're reading the bread and in the Old Testament, you find out he don't play. I read it today where he told Saul, he said, I'm reading in the New Living Translation, and he said, I've decided it's time the Malachite's debt come due. Saul, take them out, every last one of them. And uh, so when judgment comes, it comes with swiftness, but it's because the Lord promised them it was coming. That's why he was so mad at uh, that's why he was so angry at, thank you, brother. I meant to hang that up early myself, and I get sidetracked. But he was so angry at Saul because Saul caused God not to keep his word. And uh, so anyway, um, I, uh, I, I want to preface some of my comments tonight uh, or my lesson. I know it's a big handout, okay? I know it's a big handout. That doesn't mean anything. My notes are just about what they always are. But you've got to get this stuff. This is essential. It is essential. It's not negotiable. It is essential. Um, well, the, my, my comments will, will uh, uh, they, they'll be made themselves throughout this series. Um, let's pray over it right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I come to you tonight because I believe in you. I believe you indeed are the way. And that's why the way is unchangeable. I pray, God, that you will let revelation flow in this house. I pray, Lord, that, that new uh, uh, experiences and confirmation and a drawing will be evident in this place. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And uh, um, anyway, doctrine. 
a confrontation with the divine will. A confrontation with the divine will. That's the name of this series. I'm coming to you tonight from 1 Timothy. And there are three books, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, that are called the pastoral epistles or the pastoral letters. And the purpose of the pastoral epistles was to encourage and instruct Timothy and Titus in pastoral responsibilities. Now, this was by and large due to the fact that Paul was not long for the world. And Timothy, especially Timothy, but also Titus, were going to kind of step in and lead some of the congregations and, and sort of take the place of Paul as an overseer. And so he was encouraging and instructing them in pastoral responsibilities, especially with regard to sound or healthy, whole, complete teaching in matters of church organization and worship. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 11, he says to Timothy, These things, everybody say these things, things. command, say that, and teach, say that. Expositor's Greek Testament, it's a dictionary, says, Silent example or mild suggestion will not do in every case. There are many occasions when it will be necessary for you to speak out with the authority given to you at your ordination. That message is obviously to preachers, people that have a pulpit ministry. But we cannot always leave everything to silent suggestion or example. There are things that we have to command. Everybody say command. And teach. Everybody say teach. That matters. The word command, by definition, means to give a command that is fully authorized because it has went through all the proper channels. How does authority work? I was hoping that you might ask that question. You only have authority if authority has been given to you by somebody you're under authority to. All right? Authority runs downhill. Yes, it does. Matthew chapter 8, verse 8 and 9, that's when the centurion told the Lord, I'm not worthy that you come to my house. He said, but I understand authority because I'm under somebody and I have somebody under me. So that's how authority works. So this command that he tells Timothy to offer is a command that is fully authorized because it has went through all the proper channels, which says it comes from heaven. And there's power and authority acquired when we submit our lives to the will of God. And letting everybody get settled down and stuff. Because this your, your eternity hangs on it. Yes. Your ability to be saved hangs on this. The word teach means to instruct or to impart knowledge. So, the commission from Paul to Timothy is first commanded, which means clearly delineate what is expected. You don't have to get it. You don't have to understand it. You don't have to grasp every tenet of it. But you've got to know this is what is expected of you. Then teach, which is instructing and imparting knowledge that reflects the commandments or the will of God. Because when the Lord gives commands, that's what he wants. But we can back up all of these commands with good, solid, healthy teaching. And that's the process it works. Verse number 12. Everybody all right with command and teach? Verse number 12. Let no man despise thy youth. But be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation, in charity and spirit, in faith and in purity. He says, don't let them despise you. Don't let them disregard you, talking to Timothy, because you're so young. Now, we know even in the world that we live in today, people are prejudiced against young folks. Okay, they are. 
I don't particularly like it because I've preached a message. I've been thinking about pulling it out of the mothballs because it's in the mothballs, but it's what's wrong with being young. Remember Jeremiah, the, the Lord came and called him and Jeremiah said, can't do it, too young. When David went to fight Goliath, Saul said, somewhat hypocritical in my opinion, Saul said, you can't fight him, you're just a youth. Even though he's a man of war from his youth, what kind of sense does that make? So Timothy's a younger fella. He doesn't have the corn in his crib that Paul has, but he has the authority given to him. Paul got his from God, and Paul gave his authority to Timothy. So he says, don't let them despise your youth, but rather than allow your detriment or allow your weakness or allow your insecurity to identify you, be thou an example of the believers. Now look, here's a problem. When we consider our detriments, everybody in here knows what your shortcomings are. When we embrace those shortcomings and, and allow them to come to life, when we try to justify them or we try to make excuses for them because we feel pressure to do so, you know, it, it's kind of like when, when you pull up to pick up a young lady the first time and the side of your car is bashed in. She can see it, but you feel pressure to give a reason why, which is probably going to be like this. Had an accident on the way to get you, I'm getting it fixed the next week. It's a lie. You know, that's a lie. You know it's a lie, but y'all, does anybody ever, uh, it, it's in the Bible. Remember when, when uh, Peter, James, and John are up on top of the Mount of Transfiguration and Jesus is transfigured and he meets with Moses and Elijah and the Bible said when Peter, James, and John came to their self, Peter said, we need to build a temple, one for each one of you. And it says very clearly, because he didn't know what else to say. You, do you feel pressure sometimes to just respond to something or to say something just because you feel like that's what they want? Well, what happens is, is when we have a weakness and we don't know something, we will, we will, God will send us on a mission, and before we do it, Brother Blake, we'll say, now I know I'm not as smart as Brother Terrence, and I know I'm not as talented as Brother Cody, but I feel like I got a word from the Lord. Well, what I just did is I forced them to discount what I'm saying rather than do what the Lord said. Okay, what did the Lord say? But be thou an example of the believer. See, Paul went right to Timothy's own insecurity. Timothy was not as strong as Paul. Timothy, was, Timothy had some difficulties. But the most powerful way to accomplish what God has called you to do is to stop worrying about your weaknesses. Stop worrying about your insecurities. And rather than being limited by your insecurities, be set free by acknowledging the security that you have and knowing the hand of God is on your life. Now we're talking about preaching doctrine, but you cannot be sissified and preach doctrine. You can't be apologetic and preach doctrine. Look here. He said the way that you don't let them despise your youth is you be an example, a pattern, or a model of the believers, those who aspire to the message and the life of Jesus Christ. He said, I want you to be an example in word. Y'all know what that means? The way you talk, speech. In conversation, which means the behavior or your manner of life, the way you behave yourself. In charity, which is pure love, love from the heart, love like the Lord loves us with, without any hypocrisy or guile or fake or anything like that. He said, I want you to be an example of the believer in spirit, which means your attitude and your temperament. Come on, somebody. said, I want you to be an example. I want to stop right there and I want to pound some things, but they're going to come. Just wait. He said, I want you to be an example of the believer in faith, which is belief that is validated by action. 
because we know faith without works is dead. And being an example of the believer in faith is not just what you believe, but it's also in being faithful to what you believe and who you are. And in purity, which is chastity of mind and body or the absence of evil. So the way that you combat your insecurities or your detriments is be an example of the believer. The way the Lord says right here. In word and conversation and charity and spirit and faith and purity. He says in verse 13, till I come. That's till Paul comes back to where he's sending Timothy to. Give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Now Paul hopes to get back to the church at Ephesus. He hopes to get to visit them. But he says, until I come. What does that mean? What would you say? Yeah, while you're waiting. If he says, but until I come, and he don't ever make it. There you go, Brother Johnny. The important inference here is you continue to do these things. All right? Give attendance to, which means devote yourself to, focus on it. This is who you are. Give attendance to reading, which y'all understand that in the biblical days, everybody didn't have a Bible. Matter of fact, there was a man in the church whose job was to watch over the Bible. That's who Jesus gave the minister the book to, the minister that he gave the book to in Luke chapter number 4. So everybody didn't have a Bible. So the way that you heard the word is you showed up to church when somebody was reading it. So he said it's important that you hear the reading of the word. Because you're planting the word in individuals, which... Why is that important? It's where faith comes from. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. So he said the second thing is exhortation. So give yourself the reading, the word of God, hear the word of God, read the word of God, take in the word of God, and to exhortation, which at its simplest place means to go to somebody and tell them, come go with me. Come alongside of me. I feel like I'm on the right path, going in the right direction, and I feel comfortable inviting you to come go with me. In short, it means testify. And then the third thing, he said, devote yourself to the doctrine. That definition of doctrine is teaching. As it especially extends to its necessary lifestyle applications. Listen, not just in the abstract. What does that mean? Not just in the idea of it. Not just in the saying, I know it, or I believe it, but doing it. Okay, remember, he said command and teach. So we have a responsibility to do these things. Now, verse 14, he says, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. So when he said don't neglect it, he speaks to Timothy's awareness of the magnitude of the investment that God has put in him. God has given you something to do something with. Timothy has to be aware of that. In spite of being young, in spite of being sickly, in spite of having a lot of excuses to not do it, he said, don't neglect what you've been called to do and not only been called to do, but what you are empowered to do. Look here. He's got to not only not neglect the gift, but he's got to nurture the gift. That's kind of like the talents. Remember the five and the two and the one. The one, the one talent dude went and buried it in the ground and he got nothing back for it. The five talent dude made five more and the two talent dude made two more. So we have got to acknowledge, embrace, and accept that God's called us to do something for him. Okay. He says the gift was given by prophecy and with the laying on hands of the presbytery. 
So what Paul is saying is, Timothy, you are validated in heaven and in earth. It was prophesied that this was your calling and this is what you were supposed to do. And the ministering brethren laid hands on you and commissioned you. So God prophesied through his man. It was acknowledged by the council or assembly of elders. And when they laid hands on him, they prayed for him. That was significant in commissioning him to do this work. Verse 15, he says, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. So meditate means to plan, practice, or exercise yourself in. Be involved. Be connected. It's got to be on your mind. These things. What are these things? He said meditate upon these things. What are these things? Verse 12 and verse 13. He gives a whole list of things to be an example of the believer and he gives give yourself to reading, to exhortation and the doctrine. What we spend our time, effort, energy and focus on matters. And he said give yourself wholly to them, completely to them. It means to be completely absorbed by them. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm kind of scared to ask this question because I don't want to get sidetracked. But I'm going to ask you this question. How much does your calling really mean to you? How much does your ministry really mean to you? In light of how soon we are to the coming of the Lord, how close we are, are you happy where you're at? Are you happy with what you're doing? Look here. He said, I want you to meditate upon these things and give yourself completely to them that thy profiting may appear to all. What is profiting? Gain, blessed. Yeah, here it is. Are you ready for this? Progress. Which means that you are now greater or more than what you started with. He said, and your profiting will appear to all. So the evidence will be clear, both in feeling and appearance and action, etc., to everyone. But hear me as I tell you this right now. Everybody is not going to understand what God's doing in your life. And everybody is not going to understand the price you're willing to pay for him to do it. But they're going to know something's different. I got a message from a lady yesterday. Brother Shannon and I wrote some letters for one of our young men who's been in recovery in times past, and we gave him to his mother, and she texted me yesterday, and she, she said, thank you for the letters, and then like two hours later or something, she said, I just feel like I need to tell you this. And she called her son's name, and she said, he ain't never been the same after he came to your church. She said, he even told me being bad ain't the same since I went to church. Everybody knows you don't get close to the Lord without people knowing. As long as you're growing. But if you're going backwards, and we got some doing that, and it's kind of ticking me off. If you're not doing right, they're going to notice that too. So that your profiting may appear to all. I want to move on because I really want to get down to the meat of this. This is all just introduction. Look what he says. Verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Everybody say the doctrine. doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, Thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear you. 
So take heed unto yourself. Means pay close attention. Focus on your own demeanor and conduct, spiritually and naturally. How you present yourself matters. I know y'all ain't ready for this, but you're about to get it. How you look matters. How you dress matters. How you take care of yourself matters. How you present yourself matters. It matters. I said it matters. Take heed unto yourself. If you walk around all the time, I am so aggravated at people reaching out, especially ladies, they know when you're apostolic. And if you go into a place of business and act rude and act ugly, they're going to know who it is acting rude and acting ugly. Praise God. Let me tell you something. My wife got a message this long last night from a lady that was at the place Brother Ronnie was speaking at who her heritage is in this church. Okay? I got somebody that one of our ladies went to their place of business, works there, knows who you are, knows what you're doing, and you were rude and ugly when they waited on you and then didn't leave no tip. Say, well, I, I, you can't hide. When the hand of God is on your life, you can't hide. Why don't you embrace it and accept it as being a child of God, as being a minister into this world? Y'all ain't nervous, are you? Pastor's on a mission from heaven tonight. I didn't come to be mean or ugly. I'm not even in a bad mood. I'm not even mad. I'm not, I get a little frustrated and a little ticked off, but I know what God is doing in people's lives. Even some of them that you can't see it. I know he is, but I'm telling you, we're gonna have to act like Christians all the time. You don't have the option to not be a witness. All right, I'm moving on. But act like Christian. Act like a Christian. And I don't know how many times that I have told this church, as your pastor, if you go somewhere and somebody waits on you, show your appreciation by leaving them a tip. It's the way of the world now. Yes. Say, well, I don't think you ought to have to do that. I don't care what you think. Right. You represent Jesus Christ. Right. And you're representing the River Bend Pentecostals. Am I representing the River Bend Pentecostals? You represent me. Is that all right, Blakey Poo? Huh? Well, it's the truth. It's the truth. The River, I feel Jesus right now. The River Bend's on the map, folks. People know who we are. People know what we're doing. People know what we stand for. People know what we believe. And they know how we're supposed to act. It's here. How many times have I been standing in Walmart talking to somebody and people all peeking around the corner? I don't even know them. And they say, I heard that voice. I don't know who that preacher is. That, that's not a matter of, of trying to puff up or something. That's trying to call us to an awareness. You can't be a jerk no more. All right, I'm Hank Snowing now. Look here. Take heed unto yourself. It matters. So pay close attention. Focus on your own demeanor. Don't get sidetracked because I just got a little straight. Focus on your own demeanor and conduct spiritually and naturally. So pay attention to yourself. Now listen to this. And unto the doctrine. And that is Christian teaching as it especially extends to its necessary lifestyle applications. It's not just an idea in the abstract. 
It is commandments for how we live our lives from salvation to eternity. Well, look here. This teaching, he's telling Timothy, this teaching must be faithful in doctrine, which means the content, the message, and the teacher must exemplify it. He said, continue in them, which means to persist, to continue on with persistence that suits the objective. Don't stop because you're going somewhere. Don't stop because God's doing something in your life. Continue in what? Keep yourself right and preach the message. Continue in it. Continue in it. The doctrine and the example. And I want you to hear this. I'm not stuttering. I'm not stammering. I ain't trying to be super nice. The lifestyle of the believer must be just as settled as the doctrine of salvation. The corresponding lifestyle must be as settled as is the doctrine. He goes, look at here what he says. For in doing this, you'll save yourself and those that hear you. How do we save ourselves? Help me, obey the doctrine. How do we know about that? How about Acts 2 and 40? We like 38, which says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And we like 39, which says, For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. But verse 40 said, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying unto them, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. You know how you save yourself? You find out what God says do, and you do it. Wow. And it's the same principle. He said if you stick to keeping yourself right and preach the message that I gave you, teach the doctrine that I gave you, you'll save yourself. That sounds to me like that there's a responsibility of action on our part Now, we're not saved by works. Don't you misunderstand me. We're not saved by works, but we are saved unto good works. And if we are saved, filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, repent, baptize in Jesus' name, filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that only happens because you believe. And if you believe, the way you prove you believe is obey. Okay, now look here. This is a matter of salvation. He said, if you continue in them, doing this, you'll save yourself and those that hear you. Timothy's a preacher. He's being groomed to take Paul's place. Pastoral authority is being handed down to him, and he has been given the responsibility to teach and preach to people in a manner that will ensure them every opportunity of being saved. I am not trying to preach you into membership at the River Bend Pentecostals. I'm trying to preach you into being a citizen of another world. And he gave us a clear pathway to do that. I want you to hear this. Timothy's salvation is dependent upon his consecration to these principles. Okay? Brother J.R. Enzi says this, and then I, I'm going to start laying a little foundation, then I'm going to get a little deep for a minute, and then I'm going to let you go to the house. One major emphasis in the pastoral epistles is to encourage Timothy to intercept and denounce the purveyors 
of false teachings. He was to take heed unto the doctrine. Here's what I wanted to tell you. It should be on your handout. No church is stronger than the message it embraces. I'm going to say that one more time. No church is stronger than the message it embraces. And I'm going to tell you this right now. Be very leery of any church that preaches a salvation message or a lifestyle message where they tell you, we'll do it however you want. And don't you think for a second that it, the world's not full of them right now. Okay? All right. Look here. According to Zondervan, I'm going to tell you, Zondervan's Pictorial Bible Dictionary, I've told you about that a lot. I inherited it from my dad. I bought it and put it on Olive Tree, which is the Bible app that I use, and it's an incredible resource. But they are not apostolic. Okay? They're not apostolic. Zondervan is a Trinitarian organization. That's why I'm so blown away at the stuff I read in their dictionary. Look what he says here as far as defining doctrine. The term is used frequently by the King James Version to render the Greek terms didaskalia or didache. So that's the two Greek words translated doctrine in the New Testament, didaskalia and didache, both of which mean teaching, usually emphasizing the content of what is taught. In the Greek world, Teaching implied the communication of knowledge. For the most part, it had a clear intellectual character. Listen to this. Among the Jews, especially in the Old Testament, teaching served not simply to communicate religious truth, but rather to bring the one taught into direct confrontation with the divine will. Does anybody not understand what I just said? Doctrine is not just supposed to be educational. It's supposed to be transformative, which means the preaching of, I feel Jesus, my goodness. This, inter, this, found, this foundation and introduction is taking way too long for me to share because I just want to go. But it matters the message you preach. It matters. It matters. It's his way or the highway. It has to be that way. Look here. The, mess, the, me, the, the purpose of preaching is not just to put stuff in you. It's to bring you to a place. And according to the Jewish culture, which is the culture that the Bible is written under, it is to bring you to a place of Direct confrontation with the divine will. It means preaching is supposed to tell you what God wants for your life. And we've talked about it so many times. What have you come to? There you go. A place of tension. Where now I have to decide, am I going to do what God says? Or am I going to do what I want? Everybody okay? I'm in Zondervan right now. This is, not, this is not pastor. This is not the apostolic study Bible. This is Zondervan's pictorial Bible dictionary. So what is taught are the commandments. What is expected is obedience. So Moses is taught what he should do, and he in turn teaches Israel the commandments, which they are likewise to teach to their children, I'm about to get there, Brother Cody. For the most, listen to this. For the most part, the New Testament use corresponds more to the Old Testament idea than to the Greek, which is the culture they lived under. That is, teaching usually implies, here we go, Sister Miss Jane, the content of ethical instruction. 
which means the teaching and preaching of the Word of God is designed to tell you the difference between right behavior and wrong behavior. That's what ethics is. And seldom was doctrine the content of dogmas. Anybody know what a dogma is? It is the generally accepted teachings and practices of a particular church. Now hear me as I tell you this. Coming to the river bend won't save you. The Bible cannot be adapted to fit your idea of what salvation is or my idea. Calling yourself Pentecostal or apostolic or hanging out with people that do won't save you. Only obedience to the word of God will save you. Look here. He says, not the dogmas. Doctrine is not dogmas, which is the generally accepted teaching and practices of a particular church, nor is it the intellectual. You can't make this up. Nor is it the intellectual apprehension of truth. Y'all know what the intellect, I'm, I'm going to cause trouble right now, and I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings, but I got to tell you, this, this, ain't, this ain't apostolic that I'm reading to you, but it is apostolic. What is the intellectual apprehension of truth? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved. Which is truth, except a mental assent of anything is not the same as obedience. Because you can say to make your new little bride happy, that's the best meal I ever had in my life. And your mind is thinking, thank God for the dog. It's a similar concept. You understand, intellectual apprehension of the truth doesn't save you. You cannot just say, I believe, so I'm saved. It's kind of like that person preaching a funeral I told you all about. I was in the office, I could hear her on the, the thing, and she said, and I quote, the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. And she said, I'm quoting this, that means you don't even have to really believe it in your heart. If you speak it, you're saved. That's not, I didn't make that up, that was a quote. Before I knew it, I jumped up out of the office and I ran into the sanctuary and I'm standing there like, what in the world? But the thing is, is I feel Jesus right now, but help me, Holy Ghost. People have modified the truth to become more user-friendly and to try to make it easier for people to be saved. Let me tell you something, honey. It was never going to be easy to be saved. Oh, anybody, anybody can get baptized and get the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, but that don't mean you're saved. That means you get to live a saved life yes, right. under the influence of the Holy Ghost right. and he that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. Right. My, my cousin and I were talking earlier today about uh, the, the NBA and basketball. We talk about it from time to time. And he said, I can't understand people's infatuation with who's your starters. He said, I'm more concerned with who's your finishers. Because it ain't the beginning that's important. It's the one who brings it home is the important. Now, let me. Everybody okay? Everybody all right? Look here. So the example, for example, in the pastoral epistles, sound doctrine that conforms to the glorious gospel is contrasted with all kinds of immoral living. 1 Timothy chapter 1, 9 through 11, 6 and 1, 
and 3, Titus 1 and 9, 2, 1 through 5, 9 and 10. I'll be happy to share that with you later. But it's very clear that in the pastoral epistles, there is a sharp contrast between living a life in accord with the doctrine and living a life according to the world. They are not the same, nor will they ever be. Look here. Uh, I'm going to move on. So, doctrine, I skipped a little bit. Sister Heidi or Sister Scarl, whoever's back there. Doctrine came to include both aspects. Communication of religious truth, which is what introduces a confrontation with the will of God, and instruction in the ethical principles and obligations of the Christian life. So doctrine is you learn how to be saved and you learn how to stay saved and live like a saved person lives. So in short, both areas are essential and foundational as well as a part of the construction or building of a life consecrated for the glory of God and the prof and profitable to the kingdom of God. These things matter in becoming in the kingdom who you're supposed to be. I think I got three more pages. Okay. I'm about to run out of gas. Woo. Kevin, if I, if I run out of gas, you ready to finish this? I think I say for the first time ever. All right, listen here. I want you to hear what I'm about to say. These next couple of pages, stick with me. I already had this series brewing when I began to read Mere Christianity. And in the opening pages of it, I was blown away. Listen to what C.S. Lewis says. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, and then I'm going to read what he says. In his book, Mere Christianity, published in 1952, by the way, he offers a picture of the religious ideal or the ideal pursuit of what it means to be religious. Speaking of denominationalism, do you understand what I mean by denominationalism? Every different kind of church that goes under the banner of Christianity. And the search to go beyond generic Christianity to true Christianity. He determines, and I agree, don't shoot me for this because it's going to get right. We cannot paint every worshiper of every denomination as wrong because they believe differently. But we can paint them as incomplete. Because everyone that worships God with a pure heart and an earnest desire has some truth. And if they continue with that pure heart and earnest desire, they will continue to benefit from more and more revealed truth because the word tells us so, John 16 and 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. This is, of course, referring to the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which when you receive it, will guide you into all truth. But there's that, Sister Maria, there's always going to be that confrontation. Right? Every step up the ladder, every step closer to the Lord, every step into more revealed truth, there's going to come a confrontation. Ain't that right, Sister Miss Jane? It's not going to be like, I'm living in this and I love it. Woo-wee. And the Lord introduces me something else, and I'm just going to jump over in it too. And then I'm just going to jump over. There's going to always be tension. There's going to always be a dilemma. That's why the Bible says, seek out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, now look here. Perhaps there's no better example. Maybe Acts the 19th chapter. But we're going to go to Acts the 18th chapter. Perhaps there's no better example of the Spirit leading and guiding you to all truth 
than when Aquila and Priscilla encounter Apollos in Acts the 18th chapter. I want you to listen to me of, of Apollos' characteristics. He was born in Alexandria, an eloquent man. Acts chapter 18, did I have that in the handout? 18, 24 to 28. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, which was, I, I don't really know how to say what, it was the New York City of the biblical days, okay? Los Angeles, it was the place to be. He was born in Alexandria, an eloquent man, which means he was well-spoken and mighty in the scriptures, which means he read a whole lot of Bible and he came to Ephesus. Not only did he read a whole lot of Bible, he understood a whole lot of the Bible. All right? He had a bunch of good characteristics. Now look at this. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit. Y'all know what that means? Dude was lit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. So he was influential, he was impressive, but he was incomplete. Is that fair? You doing all right? Okay, you told me you were sleeping before church. That's like waving a red flag in front of a bull. I am too, bro. Don't worry. You, do y'all do see? Everybody see that? He was incomplete. He only knew part. He was a good man. He was doing a good thing. He was an impressive preacher, but he was incomplete. And Priscilla and Aquila, verse 26, and he began to speak boldly at church, and when Aquila and Priscilla had heard him, that's Paul's tent-making buddies, when Aquila and Priscilla heard, they took him unto them, which means they connected with him. They did not, they did not sit there, fold their arms. Nope, 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 nope. Can you believe this idiot? He's speaking, he's just, he don't even know the truth. No, they took him unto them, which means they made a connection. They established a relationship whereby they could expound the word of God to him, expound it unto him the way of God more perfectly or more completely. Okay. So let's, let's move on. I got a couple more scriptures there, but I'm going to move on. Now, it's not only possible, but in all likelihood probable, and I'm a witness to it, that one can be saved as a result of obeying the gospel. You can be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name, having repented of your sins, and not have the knowledge of the truth. Did y'all hear what I said? Yeah. But in all likelihood, it's not only possible but also probable that one can and will be saved as a result of obeying the gospel and not have a complete knowledge of the truth. But to stay in that place is to deny the will of God in your life. Because 1 Timothy 2 and 4, speaking of God, says who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. It's two occurrences. See that, Brother Ronnie? Now, if you'll recall, I taught you several weeks ago. God have mercy. I taught you several weeks ago that Peter preached the first Pentecostal message, Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse number 14, but over in Acts chapter 10, and Peter did say, for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord, are, whoever the Lord calls, that's who gets the promise. But in Acts chapter number 10, which was how many years later? Do you all remember that? 10. 10 years later, Peter is still struggling with being racist. He was. 
And then I don't know how I looked it up, but I can't recall. Later on, even after he preaches at Cornelius' house and said, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, Paul had to call him out because he was sitting there sharing a barbecue with the Gentiles, not any pork. <laughs> and when the Jews showed up, he got his plate and kind of, and Paul said, what's up with you, chump? You can't expect these people to listen to what you're preaching if you're going to treat them like that. So what's my point? My point is, nobody's disputing Peter filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. But he still was struggling with the truth that this was for everybody. Okay, now let me, let me move on here. Here's what C.S. Lewis says in Mere Christianity. Blew me away. He said, I hope no reader will suppose that Mere Christianity is here put forward as an alternative to the creeds of the existing communions. He's saying, I ain't trying to build a different denomination. He said, but here's what it's like when you come to God. It's like a hallway that you're in and there's a whole bunch of doors in it. Y'all got to hear this. He said it's a hallway that there's a whole bunch of doors in it. Nobody lives in the hallway. The hallway is a passageway. He said, but in the rooms is where you live. Now, I, don't want to, I can say this, but I want to make sure I keep it in the right order. He said the hall is a place to wait in. W-A-I-T, wait in, a place from which to try the various doors. The hall is not a place to live in. It is true that some people may find they have to wait in the hall for a considerable time. Are y'all with me on what the hallway is? Okay. While others feel certain almost at once which door they must knock at. He said, I don't know why there's a difference, but I'm sure God keeps nobody waiting until he sees that it is good for them to wait. When you get into your room, you will find that the long wait has done you some kind of good which you would not have had otherwise. But you must regard it as waiting, not as camping. Meaning you've got a destination. You're not homesteading in the hallway. You must, listen to this, you must keep on praying for light. And of course, even in the hallway, you must begin trying to obey the rules that are common to the whole house. And look here. You can't make this up. I found this way after I started this Bible study. I want you to listen to what he says. And above all, you should be asking which door is the true one. Not which one pleases you best by its paint and paneling. He said in plain language, the question should never be, do I like their kind of service? But are these doctrines true? I said, are these doctrines true? Is the message they're preaching the same one as the apostles preached? He says, I, I, you can't make it up. I, I can show it to you. He said, first is the doctrine true they're preaching? Is holiness here? Does my conscience and the spirit move me toward this? Look here. You have to ask yourself, is my reluctance to knock on that door due to my pride or my taste? or the fact that I don't like the doorkeeper. Yeah. 
Are they preaching the truth? C.S. Lewis said that. He was not apostolic either. He was a member of the Church of England, the Anglican Church. But in, he was an incredible thinker, and anybody who reads the Bible cannot bring out of it a Burger King Christianity. And y'all remember what the motto of Burger King is, have it your way. Uh-uh. Now, let's see. Now, give me just a second. I can finish this tonight. I started to skip my last scripture. Let's bring it home for tonight. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. He said, man, I hope y'all get this. God in mercy, I hope you get this. Especially this part right here. There's going to be some lights open. And there's going to be some challenges. And I am well prepared for there to be people who say, peace out. Look here. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the alive and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Here's what he tells Timothy. He said, preach the word. Boom. Preach the word. Sister Maria, I have testified at least twice recently, if not more times, I know twice, of Brother Terry when we sat over there in Bible study and we began to talk about Acts 2.38. And I'm going to tell you what he told me. He said, I got saved in the Presbyterian church. I got saved in the Methodist church. I got saved in the Lutheran church. I got saved in the Baptist church. And what was the fifth one? You remember? There were five. He got saved, went through the whole process, baptized everything in five different churches before he got here. And he said, not one of them even read Acts 2.38 in their service. He said, I noticed they would get to it and skip it. Now, Brother Terry wasn't flighty. He said, I have wondered all my life, why do all these churches not even read Acts 2.38? He said, because soon as I heard it read, I thought. I remember Greg Arnell was over there with us, and he said to me, why ain't everybody preaching this? He said, it's simple. It's plain as the nose on your face. They said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, what do we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Please don't buy into that nonsense that you get baptized to make a public proclamation. You get baptized because the power of the name of Jesus and faith in the power of the name of Jesus washes your sins away. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Look here, preach the word. And then he told, then he told, I got to do this, so just hang with me. Then he, and I'm going to try to hurry. He told Timothy, be instant in season and out of season. I looked it up. You know what that means? Preach it when it's convenient and when it's not convenient. Then he said, reprove. Somebody read what that says. First thing underneath this. Reprove, call it out. Is that what it says there first? Expose the guilty. Right? Call it out. Don't let it slide. Call it out. Rebuke. What's it say on your handout? Warn them. Tell them, can't do that. Let me tell you something. This kind of preaching and teaching don't go over so good in 2024. But he told Timothy, until I come, stick with it. And exhort. So it says, call them out. Warn them. And exhort means comfort them and tell them all is not lost. There's hope. 
Just because you messed up don't mean it's over. That's what it means. And then he said, with all long suffering, somebody say amen. amen. And doctrine. Here's what that means. Long suffering and doctrine. It means give people room to grow. But don't stop teaching and preaching truth while they're growing. Because the teaching and the preaching of the truth in somebody that wants to grow will result in a confrontation with the divine will. Which means my will and his will will butt heads. Verse 3, here we are. This is where we're headed with all this. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Endure means to stay in it till it's done. Chapter 13 in on being a servant of God. Sound doctrine. You know what it means? Right, reasonable, pure, uncorrupted, or healthy. He said, they won't endure sound doctrine anymore, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. That means when they don't like sound doctrine, they will surround themselves with preachers and teachers that will preach a message that's easier for them to handle than the message which sound doctrine delivers. Undoubtedly, they will have had a confrontation with the divine will and found it more of a challenge than what they're comfortable with. So an alternative must be found. I want you to hear this. A close alternative that allows me to justify being less than because it's close enough. Well, my daddy told me close don't count in nothing but horseshoes and hand grenades. Look here. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. I looked that word fable up. It means a fabrication replacing truth. The result of meeting the will of God and choosing the wrong option. So I want you to ask yourself, what is this a picture of? It's a picture of a religious world that has continually evolved until it made everybody comfortable. Are you hearing me? It continually evolved until it made everybody comfortable. I saw this video. I'm going to say this and then we're going to close. I saw this video this week. Preacher's name was Dewey. I don't know where he preached at. Don't know his background. Don't know nothing. But he said, the Lord spoke to me in prayer the other day and said, Dewey, the church has become so comfortable having church that they will go on having church whether I'm there or not. And he said, and most of them have. Now I hope to goodness over the next few weeks, which I'm going to be absent a couple of Wednesdays, I get to go preach in Moberly Correctional Center the 1st of May. I'm excited about uh, but don't get frustrated don't get mad if you feel that tension tonight take it to him if you're honestly hungry to live for God here's why I'm preaching I'm teaching this series Everybody that claims to be a Christian is not going to heaven. 
we have a responsibility to take them unto us and expound the word of God to them more perfectly. Stand with me, if you would. I feel it's getting a little bit uncomfortable in here. But I'm proud of it. Thank God. I hope this made sense tonight. I hope, it, if nothing else, it made sense to take your hand out home. Y'all got a lot of stuff on that rascal. I know some of you looked at it and turned it over. And <laughs> but here we are getting out early. Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. The Elements chapter 14 in our book. 11 o'clock we're going to have worship. God's good. He's faithful. But he's got the way he wants it done. And it will be done that way. God, I love you tonight. I thank you for everybody that's here. I thank you for your word. I thank you for truth. Thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost. I pray, God, that every person in this room with an honest heart, I don't care if they're upset. I don't care if they're challenged. That's what we were coming to do tonight is challenge all of us. But I pray, God, they will, with an honest heart, begin to pursue more of you and more than anything, feel a burden to begin to reach for empty vessels to reach for folks that they can, they can be poured into to become the answer to somebody's prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>